Well, this is going to be a long preparatory talk for what we're going to talk about tomorrow. And this time we have to uh, deal with very difficult matters, sin and evil. And these problems, or these things are so difficult that even in addressing them, one becomes subject to them. I have seen on several occasions people speaking about sin or evil, and they get so self-righteous about it that they become as ugly as sin. <laughs> and uh, if I start getting too much that way, I've been humiliated a lot of times, uh, but I hope it doesn't happen in this talk. And what's ironic about it is, is that self-righteousness is one of my most besetting sins. Rosicrucian philosophy has very interesting things to say about evil. Max Heindel, for example, makes the uh, statement something to the effect of there is no evil. And what appears to be evil is really good in the making. A pretty bold statement. Some people even find it offensive. Think about all of the wars and murders and holocausts and slavery and mental enslavement and economic enslavement and all of the other things. That statement almost sounds ludicrous. It sounds outrageous. If one looks at reality in a static sense, where there are no changes, but just looks at existential realities, which is the way most people look at the world, it is outrageous. However, if one looks at things in terms of context and the spirit of things, then it's a very different matter. If we are in an internally closed system with absolute potential and possibility, as the Rosicrucian seers and other mystics claim, then everything in that system is connected and is all unified by cause and consequence, and a statement like that is justified. Because everything is in, and everything is of God. If that system is an evolutionary creation, to some divine purpose, as the Rosicrucian philosophy claims, then the statement is not only justified, it's accurate and is beautiful in describing uh, a very sublime reality. In the spirit of that kind of a statement, it's better to have a life of a Hitler than to have a life where one does nothing. Because as the causes become consequences, uh, everything becomes one in the universal spirit. Everything becomes good. It's not to give approbation to people who want to be Hitler-like, but uh, even beings like that learn from deeds. Some seers claim that somebody like Nero had so much uh, of a terrible destiny built up from his life as Nero, he couldn't even take it for it couldn't take begin to claim it all back in two or three lives. So if one does nothing, there's nothing to grow from. Now, please don't quote me as saying that the life of a Hitler is good, because I, you know, if it's not taken in the context, context of which we are speaking, I could get myself into all kinds of trouble. Oh, he's a Hitler. I was a Christian. That's German, isn't it? You know. Now, some theologians would take exception to Max Heindel's bold statement for other reasons. The essence of that statement is evolution. 
and the essence of evolution is change. And as Hamlet says, ah, there's the rub. These are the kinds of people that see God and good as unchanging. To be fair, there really is scriptural evidence that supports such a view if one interprets it that way. The problem is that uh, we're speaking about something eternal. In our language, in our current consciousness, are just too impoverished to work with eternals. Eternals are much, so much different from our language and we can't even really deal with them. And since most of our thinking is done in terms of language, we are bound in this very small world. Thus, if one wishes to view eternals and as absolutes, then they're two very different things. Such things in absolutes, you have an unchanging God, but you could also have an absolutely changing God. You always run into paradox when you get into absolutes. If one encounters that kind of thinking, then the statement that if everything changes, does the axiom that everything changes also change? You know, it doesn't it's, it's, it, it collapses on itself. As mere earthlings, our consciousness and our language is not fit to deal with those kinds of things. Even though we grow every time we try to do it, that's the beauty of working with absolutes. Uh, we get a little bit stronger and a little bit better and do more creative work every time we do. So the statements like the bold statement of Max Heinle must be taken in spirit. Otherwise one is led into a metaphysical conundrum and you'll never solve it. All right. It is so much better and so much more fruitful since we live in an evolutionary creation to watch process. And when watching process, to see the progress that comes from it. And that is done when one intuits the purpose behind the whole process as it's going on. This is exactly what the Rosicrucian philosophy does. It is a truly modern philosophy appropriate for modern Western civilization. It does everything in terms of an ongoing process. Let's see what the Rosicrucian philosophy has to say about the cosmological and historical origin and development of sin and evil. Then, let's after that, tomorrow evening, try the spirits using the scientific method if we wish and see if it really answers to the reality that we live in. Can we experience this in ourselves and see, yes, this is what I see. Doing what we're about to do now is something that's always very, very difficult. And for me, the big difficulty is I prefer speaking from direct experience something that I have at least had a creative thought about, creative enough so that I can make a deduction as to whether what I'm thinking is true and has a lot of integrity. I'm not a desire world clairvoyant. But even not being a desire world clairvoyant, I can test out the laws of attraction and repulsion and see that they work in my life. So you don't even have to be a clairvoyant. What we're about to go into can also be tested, but it's much more difficult because to actually see what you're testing, you have to be a highly trained clairvoyant. So the Rosicrucian philosophy does not ask 
for blind faith about these matters. It doesn't ask for a complete acceptance about uh, evolution and how things came to be. All it really asks is that you give it a good hearing. It's not fanatical in the way that it asks you to follow everything. The Rosicrucian philosophy is, at least for me it is, it's something like in the philosophy of science. It's a tentative hypothesis. And there are some parts of it that I have no way in the world to check out. But uh, as life goes on, more and more parts of it are not, no longer tentative. There's something I can prove for myself. So, in that regard, the Rosicrucian philosophy is something like uh, science for a lay person, something that you can check out in your daily life. Much easier than science, because to keep abreast of science, it's a uh, very difficult task. It requires a high degree of intelligence and many years of study with increasing specialization. And uh, most of the vanguard of modern science can't even be put in terms that you and I can understand. And we like keeping it that way. In fact, there's so much study and specialization in modern science that by the time a person becomes a scientist, they don't realize how much they've been indoctrinated. There's almost as much indoctrination in the sciences as there is in a divinity school. If we accept the basic axioms of material science, uh, what they say follows very well. However, it's in those basic axioms that things are difficult. Now, things of mystical science are difficult in another way. Most of the things that we address are not of this world. And some of them are quite far-fetched. And like being in touch with them is, is not an easy business. But if we closely watch behavior, and if we tune in inward light, we can get some pretty good ideas about it. Max Heindel likes to quote the alchemists saying that if we do the great experiment, the great experiment for the alchemist was living the alchemical life, proving it by your own living. And that's the spirit we're going to try to uh, follow. All right. Now, the first of many introductions. So we're trying to understand how things came to be as they are now with regard to sin and evil. According to the Rosicrucian philosophy, all of the beings that we see, and even those that we don't see, are participating in an activity that is called an evolutionary creation. It's evolutionary in that it has logic, it has a rationale, it has a method, and it has purposes toward which it works with greater and greater improvement builds on past experiences, and new experiences are built from the past. It is a creation in that it is new, and it's carried out with all of the love and creative art and much more than we put in our creation. What we're living in is not whole hum. It's not old hat. It's not cut and dried. Even for the universal spirit, it is new. It's impossible that everything in the whole creation could be learning something and improving and getting better and producing new things and the universal spirit not become renewed or learn new things. The 
evolutionary creation takes place within the same interdependent twin potentials that physics sees. That is the potentials of time and the potentials of space. But what is meant by time and space to mystics who can see and can experience is something very different in the way concepts of time and space are used in material science. One difference is that those potentials are more variable and dimensional and less constant and in two dimension. Each of these potentials has something manifest in it. And these interdependent or codependent, but at the same time independent manifestations have a regular interaction between themselves and between the beings that are becoming within them. There are periods of spiritual character in time. There are globes of matter in space. And there are revolutions and changes of consciousness between the interplay of spirit and matter in time and space. Because it is one spirit that is manifest throughout time and space, in spirit and matter, Everything is analogous. There are analogies between the periods of time and between the globes of space or matter and between the revolution. Everything is analogous to things lasting many millions and billions of years to things that last a billionth of a second in terms of time. I was, I'm stating this in a very uh, uh, dogmatic way, almost, just to get it said. Uh, I'm not trying to discuss the whole rationale of it or the hows and whys of it. I'm just trying to give the description so that we can see whether the, what the outcome of that description is meets what we experience in ourselves. Again, speaking... Uh, overly authoritatively and speaking, uh, laying almost like with a dictum or something like that is not very pleasant to me. I can do it, but I don't like doing it. There are seven periods of time which are given seven astrological names. And they are given these astrological names not because they are inhabited by those planets, but because both those periods of time and the planets share the same quality of spirit. There are seven globes of matter in each of the seven periods of time. In the Rosicrucian philosophy, those seven, period, those seven globes are given the names of the first seven letters of the alphabet. It would have been much better if the same astrological names had been given to those globes. That could have caused enormous confusion with people confusing them with the planets that we see in the sky. And in each period, through the seven globes of matter, there are seven revolutions of the primary pulse of consciousness that passes through the seven globes seven times in each period. It is a matter of proceeding deeper and deeper with a pulse of consciousness into matter and then withdrawing. Now this elucidation is extremely brief. 
it could take as many as 20 or 30 uh, books, several hundred pages, to give a really good rendition. And the probable conception is a brief rendition. It's also, this presentation is also specialized. And it's specialized to our humanity and to one facet of our development as we became humans. Even this slant, this anthropocentric slant, is uh, only for the topic of looking at sin and evil. In the evolutionary creation, the universal spirit works its way deeper and deeper into matter. It works its way into matter and then it works its way out. This is done cyclically and with each cycle into matter and withdrawing from matter, it becomes more awake. In this process, or in this evolutionary activity, there are three activities. The materialization of spirit, not only into macrocosmic globes, but into forms of all of the spiritual beings that are participating in the evolutionary creation. The spiritualization of matter, where the potential within matter is taken into spirit for new waking consciousness. And the third process is the awakening and evolution of consciousness that comes about as a result of the materialization of spirit and the spiritualization of matter. The whole process is very gradual, very cyclical, and one passing through this experience goes through many, many, many different kinds of experience, and each experience brings out something different out of the potential of the spirit that is participating. It's something like if you are somebody who does a lot of praying, it's like a cyclical prayer where you work with the prayer and each time you go into the realms of spirit deeper and deeper and deeper and then gradually you come out. Uh, a good prayer is based on the same kind of structure of activity as the cosmic creation. The metaphor that is given in the Rosicrucian Cosmo concept is that it is like using a drill or something to bore into dense matter. You go down into matter as far as you can go without burning out the drill or without burning out the uh, boring tool, and then you withdraw. And after you've rested and cooled off, you repeat and you go through deeper and deeper until there is a breakthrough. And that breakthrough for us is waking consciousness. We are new foci that are capable of self-conscious awareness of spiritual being. If you want to take that metaphor even further, the, if you're working with a drill, all of the pieces come out. And those pieces are sort of like soul matter that are being withdrawn in the process of evolution. In the first half of this greater process, this universal spirit in each of the first three and a half periods proceeds deeper and deeper into matter. In the second three and a half periods, it withdraws and returns more and more to the spiritual world. So that in each period itself, each period goes deeper into matter and then comes out, 
and then the periods themselves go deeper into matter and then comes out and uh, it's an analogous process just the way we said all the way through the six street analogy if you're trying to follow this in your imagination it's probably best to think of it with the depth of matter becoming more and more outward that if you are in yourself and you are in full consciousness, you are completely universal. But if you become more and more concentrated and externalize and objectify something into a denser state of consciousness, that is more what it is like. Uh, it's, a, it's a better way to, to work with your imagination with it. The first half of uh, the whole process is called involution because the spirit gets more and more involved in matter and in the bodies in matter. The word involution literally means turn into. Unfortunately, the second half is called evolution, which is a correct English word uh, which means to turn outward. Uh, unfortunately, the whole process is also called evolution. And that's, uh, you know, there's confusion there. It would be nice if you could uh, call the second half exvolution or something like that, but the language just doesn't allow it. We need to rewrite the English language. It's, it's greatly in need of... Uh, there used to be a, a sort of a, a language that vaguely talked about these things a long time ago, but there's been so many improvements in the understanding that that language is no longer applicable. <laughs> uh, there are many beings that are foci of the universal spirit that are participating in the evolutionary creation. In these myriads of becoming beings, there are waves, just like there is a general pulse, central pulse that passes through the whole thing, revolving and revolving deeper and deeper. So there is a, uh, there are waves within that general pulse, such as we know. The animals are one wave behind us, and the plants another wave behind the animals, and the life inside our present mineral kingdom is yet another wave. So there are myriads of beings that stretch, as the old statement goes, from quad to God. Those at the very beginning of it which were only there in potential, though they took part of, uh, they were part of the blissful consciousness of the universal spirit, though they didn't know it, when they enter evolution are deeply unconscious. Like our minerals are like that, very deeply unconscious. As things go on, we, from the experience, we all work toward greater and greater waking consciousness and objective consciousness so that we not only know that something is, we know what it is or how it is or why it is. And we work toward self-consciousness. But self-consciousness isn't always limited to the one of the foci, like I am a self, but to the general self the general waking of the entire universal spirit. Those that uh, have awakened self-consciousness, when they have gone through enough stages to become beings and to awaken to selfhood, are co-creators. But whether one is a creature still involving or whether one is a creator that is evolving and is co-creating 
everything is of service. There is no waste. It isn't like uh, we tend to treat our children, where the children are of no use to us until a certain age, and then we push them out and say, all right, now you're on your own. Everything is of use. There is no waste anywhere in the cosmos. And if we can self-consciously, intentionally, and volitionally find and work with the purpose and the use of even every little thing, we are truly living creative lives. Now, we see that even though we're slowly working toward greater self-consciousness and greater creativity, uh, we have more and more that we can do. But we as human beings, our creativity isn't very good. If we look at human creation versus the, the general creation that is in nature, you look, you know, you go out in the country sometime, you go sometime to a city, and you see our creations compared to what nature does are very ugly. Even a weed patch, an accidental weed patch, has its own magic, and it's very beautiful. Because, you know, we have like chemical spills and things like that. Our activities are destructive and polluting, and we have no respect for our co-participants, at least the ones we can get our hands on, the animals and vegetables. We're actually hindering them in many cases rather than helping them. We take an apple, for example. An apple is not allowed to evolve. It's exactly the same if you take a, like the delicious apple, which is what everybody sees when you say the word apple. That delicious apple, all the delicious apples are one tree. And that tree has been around for years and years. And it's, it hasn't been allowed to evolve because everybody likes the delicious apple. And when you do something like that, the uh, predators, the bugs and the diseases that prey on apple trees, they're evolving, but the apple isn't. So to try and keep it that part of the past uh, forever and ever, we have to use more and more poisons and sprays and things like that. It's pretty ghastly what we do. So we are terribly not only ugly, we're inefficient. We kill each other, and we destroy each other's works, and often to no good end at all. So we're ad harmonious to the ongoing creative process. What we as mystical students are trying to do is we're trying to learn how it works and why it works so that we can do something about harmonizing ourselves uh, with the process. That is provided that we aren't perverse, which sometimes we are. Sometimes we know better and we're stupid enough to make the same stupid mistakes over again and again, even though we know better. Um, all right, with that in mind, uh, let's uh, start examining in more detail the uh, evolutionary creation. The names of the seven periods or revolutions or globes in order of appearance are Saturn, Sun, Moon, Earth, which we are in right now, we're right in the middle of the middle of the middle, Jupiter, Venus, Vulcan. Because the Earth period is the turning point, the very extremity of materialization, after which the entire cosmos gradually withdraws in the remaining two and a half periods, the Earth period is divided in half, one half being involutionary and one half being evolutionary. As a consequence, the first half of the Earth period is called Mars, and the second half is called Mercury. And 
atavistic reminder of this whole scheme is built into the days of the week, which have never changed for as long as uh, history has been known, so that we have Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, named after Tyre, Mars of the Norse, uh, Wednesday, named after Wotan, the Mercury of the North, Thursday or Thor's Day, which is Jupiter's Day, and Friday, because Freya is the Norse Venus. In this scheme of things, where we have the two halves of the Earth period, each given a day of the week, the final period, when everything is rest and recapitulation, the Balkan period, is not mentioned in the day of this week. Um, if you look into uh, Hebrew mysticism, the seven branch candlestick is named after these. The earth is in the middle and there's Saturn, Sun, and Moon on one side, and on the other side there is Venus, uh, Jupiter, Venus, and they don't call it Vulcan. I forget what the name is. Do you know what it is, Tommy? Do you know, Bob? Oh. We're going to have to send you back to Saturday school. That's the way. <laughs> Shula. That's, that's the way it goes. Now we're going to look at a few bits and pieces of this grand scheme. We're going to take a few shovels of a mountain, basically. In the Saturn period of our solar creation, things were very different than they are now. And it would be a great mistake to consider them and think of them as things are now. There was no sun. There was no solar system. For most of the whole Saturn period, everything was primarily in spirit. Things have to be worked out in spirit before they become manifest. And when things did become manifest, the only concretion that there was was that the solar system or the, the solar cosmos would be the better word became as dense as a concrete thought. Everything else was transcendental. So when we started uh, the drilling into the world, even the drill was not made of substance. <laughs> and the substance was all primarily in spirit. Space was dark. And the only thing about it was that there was warmth. There was an area of warmth of what was to become our solar cosmos. We, you and I, who are human now, were then mineral-like. We were mineral-like in that we were capable of experiencing shape and texture and form and such. We were worked on by beings much the same way that we work on the material bodies or the mineral bodies of plants and animals, and especially chemical things. Now, obviously, since things were no more dense than a thought, uh, we, the working on us was done by thinking. We were worked on in thought, and because thought is tonal, it is a world of sound, we were worked on almost like music. And if it took, we sort of resonated in harmony to what was emanated to us. And if it didn't take, it echoed, and uh, the uh, thoughts were splattered all around. I don't know how far to go into detail here. But by we're being work on, worked on, we experienced form and substance, which were to be the basis of all of our future physical bodies. And all of our bodies in all of the worlds, no matter what the dense physical body, no matter how dense that matter was. Our consciousness was similar to the consciousness of our current minerals. Not exactly the same, but similar or analogous. That is like a deep trance. It's more unconscious than conscious. 
And because we were that much unconscious, we were resistant to the very supple and subtle consciousness of the divine beings who were working on us with thought. And that resistance is like is analogous to the resistance of our minerals to this day. And it served the same end as far as the cosmos is concerned. Our resistance is what allows us all beings, the, the resistance of the mineral kingdom is what allows all beings in this world to have stable bodies because the, it resists change. If it weren't for the resistance in the mineral kingdom, our bodies would puddle away into nothing. And that resistance had another aspect to it. The reflection of resistance is the will to make resistance change. And our ability to spiritually take will was developed after we had the experience of resistance in a mineral state. Eventually, the drill had to be extracted and the cosmos went into a state of rest. And it started all, all over again, only one level deeper. Now, mind you, these worlds are different than our world. And when we say that in this new period, the sun period, there was light, it isn't like the light that comes out of this light bulb. It is a light of a different kind. It is a light that permeates the desire world because this time the cosmos became as dense as a desire. And we, the evolving beings, learn the ability to have to make living, growing, changing forms. That's what we learned and what we dreamed on during the rest period between the periods. So we develop the capacity to be living and vital. We call that a vital body. Every new manifestation begins as a thought. So that new vital body was made in thought. From the exercise and experience of living through changing forms in the spirit, the capacity for imagination and for spiritual illumination was born. The principle of the cosmos that first you experience something in manifestation, and from that experience in manifestation, a spiritual power or capacity is developed. So first you experience resistance, and you develop will. Then you develop morphability, and from that morphability, you learn imagination and the light that lights imagination. This is all very, very brief. But uh, after this, everything took another rest, a very deep rest. And when the universal spirit could re-manifest, it re-manifest more deeply in what we call the moon period. In the moon period, the cosmos became as dense as the ethos. If you like the modern science jargon, which is not quite uh, perfectly accurate, but it's close, the cosmos became as dense as an electromagnetic field. In the moon period, we who are now humans became animal life. Not animals, but animal life meaning we became capable of having forms that not only lived and changed shape, but that were detached and capable of moving around. We were no longer planted. Plant means that. It's something that's planted and it's rooted in the ground and it's stuck there. We became animal-like in that we uh, were capable of... Uh, moving from place to place. And in order to move from place to place, you have to have some incentive. And again, a new vehicle was added. And that vehicle 
is the desire body. We've been talking about all week, and which we're going to talk about uh, tomorrow, and be very practical tomorrow. This this seems almost impractical, but it's something we have to discuss. And that new desire body, like every other vehicle, was begun in the world of thought. So our desire body was made of thought, our vital body was made of desire stuff, and our physical body was made of ether in the moon period. So we had then a desire body that gave us motivation. We still didn't have external sense perception, but we had internal perception because our consciousness was not like a plant, which is sort of like a dreamless sleep, or it was not like a mineral-like state, which is like a deep, dark trance. Uh, once in a while you get that kind of a sleep. Uh, it was more like the animals have now where the external reality is seen in terms of internal picture. That complete outwardness was not there yet because the spirit wasn't indwelling to be able to look out through its vehicles of consciousness and see the reality. Oh my goodness, we're that slow. I thought we could go along faster than this. Well, we'll be all right though. The uh, ability to detach and be individual, when we experience that, that again reflected back into the spirit. And if there is a separate body, that dawns on the spirit of saying, I can be a separate self. So we then had a threefold body and we had a threefold spirit that was capable of will, imagination, light, and love to hold the imaginations together and selfhood. Selfhood, that is an idea. And it is an idea of spirit as a being. And so that is what we call self with a capital S or ego with a capital E. I don't like to use the word ego so much because in modern times that has come to mean something with a small e, but with uh, exaggerated self-importance. So, we have a threefold body and a threefold spirit. Until this point, we've only talked about the life wave that is now our humanity. We're not alone. There are many, many exalted beings whose evolution and whose development of consciousness is beyond almost our capacity to even understand. Some of the uh, highest spiritual work that was done on us and giving us even, giving the whole cosmos the potential to begin was done by beings that didn't even have to participate in the cosmos. It was done by beings who gave of themselves with no possible hope of anything for themselves. The highest spiritual work can only be done in complete freedom. That's something that I think is really important to our development. It's like love. You can't make somebody love you. If somebody loves you, it's because they feel free to love you. And out of the freedom and the fullness of their love, they give that to you. Similarly, the whole potential for time and space to be prepared for a creation was given by beings that are called the Xenophim and the Teraphim that are so exalted they didn't even need to be here, but they made a sacrifice. And so the whole thing began. Now, just, you know, and behind us in the creation, there are the animals, the plants, and the minerals, and there are all kinds of other elemental beings that haven't really started an evolution yet. And in, a, in sort of a dumb show, they participate in the, uh, in the whole creation. So it's a really marvelous thing. 
all of the uh, divine beings that are co-creators in the Bible, they're called the Elohim. In Rosicrucian philosophy, they are called the creative hierarchies. So, if we could have one glimpse of all the beings, because the whole being, the whole cosmos is alive. Everything in the cosmos is the body of some being. There's not dead stuff out there that we work on. It's all part of a living thing. And the sooner we learn to see that everything is part of a living spiritual being and give to it with reverence and awe in that everything is serving and giving in the whole process, the quicker our spiritual growth uh, will be. But if we had only one glimpse for one moment of all the hierarchies that were working on us, we would be humbled and enlightened and changed in such a way that we would never ever be the same again. Spiritual health is a product of humility because in humility we're open. We don't have any pretense and when we're open the spirit that is in us flows out and it flows out with great power and awe and wonder in such a way that you know, it's really great. Now we're talking about the moon period. And in the moon period we were developing these motive desire bodies. And the beings who are now our angels were human-like. And in the human-like stage, it's a very critical time. It is when one passes from being a creature, completely guided by other beings, to becoming a creator. And a true creator is always faithful to the muse always faithful to the spirit within. But in that time, from going from creature to creator, there's slip. From the time when we're worked on until we work on others, there is a slip. Normally, the way things go is that the spiritual hierarchies release the reins or the tracers on humanity as we become more uh, awakened. But there's always room for slip. It's a time when things are spinning one direction and are brought to spin the other direction, which means that things come close to a dead halt. And this brings us to something that... Uh, we haven't talked about here. We're in the fourth days of these talks and we have not given anything like a description of the desire body, the human desire body. So we're remiss and we have to talk about that right now. So this is be a little vignette, a little aside of one kind. Our desire body is very young in its development. It's only had one full period in the first half of the earth period to develop. So it's only in its second stage, which is its plant-like stage, its sun-like stage. It's not organized. It has no organs, no systems of organization, such as the dense physical body and the etheric vital body. Those, those have high degrees of organization. They've been around for a long time. It is only when it appears before the uh, inner eye, it appears as an ovoid, as an egg, stretching as much as 14 to 18 uh, inches out from the body. But that's a misleading description. That is makes it seem like a lot of... Uh, People who are not knowing about the desire world, they think that the desire body is an emanation from the physical. It really isn't. It's not the physical world. It is the desire world. Like there's a close association between the vital body and the physical body because they're both of the physical world. 
But if you have clairvoyance, it's almost sometimes with desire clairvoyance, it's almost like the colors are getting in the way from seeing somebody's physical body because it's like in another dimension of space. It's in it's proximate to where the physical body is, but it's in another dimension of space. When yesterday, when we looked at the horoscope of Nikola Tesla, when he was a child, he had all of this light coming from within. And he had his desire world vision. And for most of his years of maturation, he had a hard time bringing the desire world that he saw with his inner eye into uh, focus with his physical vision. He had trouble in school because he often couldn't see with his physical eyes because the flashes of light that were coming in from the inside uh, were such that they were distracting him. And so that he, to have both uh, foci at the same time was a very, very hard thing. So, all right, we're, we're talking about the uh, desire body. The desire body has a mood, and that mood is a general tone or a general color that is always there. There are some people, when they walk in the room, you can feel the electricity, and that is their mood. There are other people who are dour, and when they walk in the room, it's as almost as if a shadow has walked into the room. And each of us has a mood and we have a color. It has a lot to do with uh, uh, our ethnic background, with our social background, our religious background, and how free we are. The only things in the desire body, there are a lot of evanescent changes that now they're there, now they're not. You know, like if you if you experience something new, you go through a whole sequence of emotions, rapid fire. Sometimes you can see it on a person's physical face as they're going through a bunch of uh, a bunch of emotional changes. You see one expression after another go run across the face, and it's, it's a miraculous thing to see. But that's nothing compared to what's happening in the desire world at the same time. The physical body can't keep up with the desire body, but there is it within this, even to the inner desire body. And that is, in the desire body, there are vortices, whirlpools. And the more defined an individual is in their emotional nature, the more defined the whirlpools are. So that if they're really well defined, they're just the opposite of a whirlpool. If you see a whirlpool in water, the, the more defined it is, the more dark it is in the center. But in the desire body, the more defined it is, the more it is filled with brilliant light. There are seven such whirlpools, obviously, which again relate to the same seven, but we won't go into that, in the desire body. There's one proximate to the center of the forehead, one at the back of the head, like somebody who has eyes in the back of their head, one near the voice box, one near the genitals, one at each knee, and then there is the great vortex, is the one near the area of the liver. And from the one that's in the area of the liver, there is like an inner dimension of the desire body such that the desire stuff comes pouring out through the vortex of the liver constantly. And it fills, it's constantly filling the desire body with new light. And then the light goes back in through the six other vortices. And according to which vortice it goes in, and how it goes in, it has something to do with our conscious attention. We're talking about things that to get into, you're going very deep into meditational consciousness. In fact, you can, if you are in a deep state of meditation, where like in the morning exercise, if you can get so that you can lay there almost close to death, so that your body is hardly breathing at all, you can be sensitive to the vortices of your desire body and you set them spinning as an act of will. 
And this is how one learns to leave the body. It's a little scary. It's one of those impossible things that you have to do with spiritual exercises. Like, for example, if you take healing prayer, that's another almost impossible thing. You have to pray with all your might to do a really good healing prayer, but you can't get tense. You have to be relaxed and intense at the same time. And with the... uh, uh, with the morning exercise, when you start to get th- set things spinning, you have to be very calm, and yet at the same time, it's extremely, extremely exciting, and that's the part where you usually blow it. Uh, in animals and in human beings that are psychonegative, that have a dark negativity about them, And in unnatural fear, those vortices spin one direction. That is up the right side of the body, around and in. But in most human beings who are in control of their life, they they come up from the left and around and around and in. So when you pass from the stage of involution to the stage of evolution, you are stopping things from spinning one way and you are causing them to spin another way. And if one is deeply clairvoyant, that's when there's a great definition and a great light at each one of them. Now, those are just physical things we're talking about because corresponding to the spinning of the directional spinning of each of these vortices, there is a change in consciousness. Obedience is what is called for in the animals and in the creatures. The more obedient an animal is, the better it is going to evolve. But when it becomes, uh, when one becomes a creator, then one has to be more and more self-reliant. You can't ask somebody to set things spinning for you. So in your consciousness, when you're passing from a state of great obedience to a state of great self-reliance, you're in a vulnerable position, a very vulnerable, vulnerable position. All right. In the moon period... when the, what are now angels were human-like, it was critical for them also. The conditions of our solar cosmos were very, very different. But still, there was something like the etheric equivalent of heat at the center of this whole uh, solar cosmos. And something like water, still associated with the moon, vaporous, a something that was capable of sympathetically taking all conditions of the etheric realm that was the densest realm at that time was circulated by the hot center. What happened was that some of the beings of the angelic life wave chose and preferred to stay around the hot core. They refused to leave that center because at the center is where all of the greatest creativity is taking place. And they wanted to be great creators, not realizing that balance of the cool and the hot, so to speak, made for a better human being. In short, these, this segment of the, or this uh, group of the angelic life wave specialized. Now they happen to be the most brilliant of the angels and they thrived and they thrilled to creative fire. But nonetheless, specialization in evolution is always dangerous. Specialization is Saturnian. And therefore, it's very liable to selfishness. 
Now, specialists can thrive in a special condition. But they fail in generalization. In overall evolution, generalization is what counts. Max Heindel says that adaption is the chief principle of evolution. And being capable of adapting to all the varying conditions, psychological conditions as well as physical conditions, is what the whole evolution is about. Because adaption to that causes us to bring things out of ourselves so that we become. And that's exactly what happened to what are called the Lucifer spirits. They did not experience everything. And they didn't adapt to the cooler conditions and the receptivity that went with them. So they were active and projective, but they were not receptive. And they were not receptive so that they could not experience the etheric wisdom that flowed through their densest vehicles at that time. And as a consequence, they screwed up their whole evolution. Now, these are the conditions. There was what is called a divine rebellion or a war in heaven that was going on in the desire world in the moon period. Now, when something is being developed or when something is being born, it takes on the conditions that surround it. This is how astrology works in the physical world. When we're born, we know that little children are all eyes and ears and they're tremendously sensitive. But if you go right back to the instant of birth when the first breath is taken, they are infinitely sensitive and receptive. And when they take that first breath, the whole future character is stamped on the physical etheric uh, organism and that is the basis of the horoscope. So similarly, in the moon period, when our desire bodies were being born, they were being born in a, an atmosphere that was pervaded by rebellion, that was pervaded by separativeness, like we want to do this special thing. All right, now we're, right now, we are just past the midpoint of our whole evolutionary creation. More precisely, we are in the fifth epoch of the fourth lobe of the fourth revolution of the fourth or earth period. But after the big rest of the moon period, and things started all over, uh, a new but one level denser, the densest that our solar cosmos becomes, that is as dense as this stuff, the Lucifers were in deep doo-doo. They couldn't proceed forward with the angelic life wave because in order to do so, they would have to follow the currents of wisdom that flowed through the etheric world and through the etheric vital bodies. But they had a rebellion to them, so not enough flowed through them so that they could continue on in that way. But they couldn't become human beings because they had no experience with the physical matter, so they couldn't build a physical body. So they were ad harmonious to the whole physical, to the whole cosmic scheme, but you couldn't eliminate them. You couldn't eliminate them. They weren't evil. They hadn't destroyed anybody. They weren't a threat to the whole cosmos. So basically, they were left to fend for themselves. They were no dummies. They needed experience. And when you're hungry, especially when you're hungry for experience, I had a friend that I'm almost convinced, and in fact I am convinced that in a past life, he didn't make it past the dweller. He tried to get past the dweller too soon. And uh, this whole life, his life was just 
empty. What he needed most was service and he couldn't do service. And so he was soul hungry and he died in his 40s. He didn't have a sober month from age 10. He took every kind of drug you can think of and ended up dying of alcoholism because he was trying to shut down that soul hunger. And he had just that kind of a temperament. He's cracked up a whole bunch of cars because he knew just exactly how fast you could go around the curb and he was going to go a little faster. He was always, what they say, pushing the envelope. So they needed experience. And they knew that we would be vulnerable at the right time. And so what they did is they bided their time until just the right time. And that came in the third epoch of the fourth revolution of the Earth period, which is called the Lemurian Epoch. In the first three and a half revolutions and the first two epochs, we did a lot of recapitulatory work. We rebuilt all of our vehicles, but we rebuilt them to accommodate a nervous system a nervous system through which the spirit could enter the body and work through the brain and nervous system. So we were doing that kind of developmental work. In that third epoch, we were recapitulating the moon period. Every third revolution, every third globe, and <coughs> every third epoch within a revolution and globe we recapitulate the moon-like qualities. So at that time, we were animal-like human beings. We were still human beings, but we were animal-like. We were recapitulating those states. The part of the humanity, our part, was associated with the planet Earth because the solar system was just forming at this time and we formed with the uh, solar system. This is the time that is called Adam, the time of Adam and Eve in the Bible. And the earth was still hot from being thrown off inside the solar system. And this is why the name Adam in Hebrew means man of red earth. The earth was red hot. Now what happened is, is our consciousness was still inward very much like the animal consciousness is still inward now. We were sort of like great big teenage, you know, like it was like a perpetual teenage type of quality that we had. The Lucifers approached us from within. They could associate and interpenetrate our vital bodies with theirs. And they did that. And in that developing nervous spinal column, they came into the, our cranial consciousness through the sacrum and uh, sexual organ area and they interpenetrating us and this they appeared coming up the spine as though they were serpents to the inner vision. This is why the serpent in the Garden of Eden story. And they insinuated their way into our consciousness. Now, as we were changing from involution to evolution, the inner light was becoming more and more dim. And very vaguely, we were dawn it was dawning on us that there was an externality. This was what was intended in our evolution. And what happened was that uh, we became somewhat aware of the fact that we were changing physical bodies. And they brought it to our attention that those physical bodies were dense and that they were limitations to us and that with regard to those physical bodies, we were not immortal. <coughs> but they misrepresented. They told what were truths, but they told them in such a way that we didn't understand it correctly. I didn't say it with words like this. They showed us pictures, and you can show somebody a series of pictures, and you can lead them down the garden path from the way the 
of whom the organization knew pictures. This is why they appeared to the women. When we were in female bodies, we all uh, manifest one time in male bodies, one time in female bodies. The female body is always, it still is, and has always been more receptive. And it is more receptive in such a way that it is open to moral training. If you look in the complete history of mankind, all the moral training has always come from women. Uh, or I shouldn't say it that way. It has always come from those in uh, women's bodies. It's, 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 a, it's a much more accurate way to, to say it. And they intimated to us that if we took charge of this sexual energy at the base of our spine and used it freely at will that we could become as gods. We would then be immortal. And we selfishly fell for it. Perhaps it was insecurity at the whole notion of death and the closing off from the universal spirit, uh, but it, it, we, we fell for it. Now, sex was not the sin. The sin was that we took it into our hands before we knew how to use it in harmony with the cosmos to produce healthy bodies every time. And so the consequence of it was that we jumped the gun and then we were very, very vulnerable ever after. There are all kinds of ramifications uh, that took place. Uh, because we still had inner vision, we were capable, you know, we were capable of doing all kinds of things. We were, we were natural born magicians. And many of our humanity completely washed out altogether just by doing black magic against each other. I'll show you. I'll take away that body. You're not immoral. I'll take that away from you. And that's what many did. They had to be pulled away from the rest of us lest we would all become hardened and become failures. One of the Another one of the ramifications is, in, is that the sexual organs, the genera, are made sensitive, and they are made sensitive at, well, this is ironic, the way it happens, they were made sensitive so we would use them as an incentive, as an incentive to use them properly. Because as long as we knew that that same spiritual energy that is used in sex is what we use to become divine beings, it would have been like a lot of people are these days. They hold it selfishly for their spiritual development and they don't give bodies to anybody else. And so the genera were made to be exceedingly uh, sensitive. But we got into the habit of liking that sensitivity. Once you let selfishness in the door, it all, it all goes downhill. And so we became more and more sexual. And as a consequence... When more of our consciousness was turned downward and outward, we came deeper into materiality than was dependent, uh, than, than, than was uh, intended for us. I must be tired. I'm using words that, uh, <laughs> that clang associations is what Carl Jung calls them. They sound the same, but they're different words. Uh, and so... We, we, and since we're part of the creation, and especially when you're in the human stage, you're very, a very important part of the creation, we made the whole universe or the solar universe more material than it was intended to be, and we became materialists. And as a consequence, we shut off the inner vision even more. So we were cast out of the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden means that we could see in the spiritual worlds. There were four streams in the Garden of Eden which represent the etheric flows that flow into the etheric brain and the, the cranium area, and we were cast out of that. But the big thing is that when we took creativity into our hands, 
creativity is godlike. This is one of the definitions of a god. A god creates. And when we took creativity in our hands, we were declaring to the universe, we are creative beings. And this means that the hierarchies could no longer lead us around by the nose. We still needed some guidance, and we still are guided yet by religions and religious spirits, by astrological influences. We're still guided. But what happened was they couldn't lead us exactly. So we were in sort of a pickle. And the hierarchies which guide us were in a pickle. But mind you, all the time, the first and second sins have been with us. And they've been increasing. The sins of Adam and the sins of Cain. The sins of sex. The sins of violence. All of our... The VCR was developed so that uh, people could see porn in their own homes. Sex. Huh? Yeah, now say yeah. A lot of the technical advances. You see, when we are functioning with this kind of consciousness that is not harmonious with the cosmos, and we're, when we're in personal brain-like consciousness, we're out of touch with a harmonious relationship to the cosmos, and in that out-of-touch state, we can be harvested for experience by the Lucifers. And the more desireful we are, the more we get our jollies in power or in working with technical things, the more they can harvest us. It's the extreme emotions that we open ourselves up and let off energy and experiences and everything else that uh, they get at us. If we get angry. We get luciferic angry. You know, we, you know, we lose all kinds of energy. Now, what's that? The sins of of Adam and Cain. Yeah, the sin of Adam was uh, taking sexuality into hand, and the sin of Cain was violence, the murder of his brother. And the two are tied together, and that's what we looked at all all this afternoon. We looked at the uh, two two poles of Mars, the Luciferic Mars qualities, in uh, horoscopes. We saw we saw what that resulted as. And that's really interesting because now the way it's been stated here, it's been stated in an extreme way. Our evolution didn't stop. We kept experiencing in our desire nature. We kept experiencing attraction and repulsion and all the lessons that we learn in the desire world. And even though in Lemuria we were like perpetual teenagers and that... Uh, in Atlantis, we were like perpetual college kids. We haven't really, the real self hadn't come in, or the possibility for the real self hadn't really come to be. We were still learning. And what happened was, is that more and more, as we began to differentiate between attraction and repulsion, and between the higher desire body and the lower desire body, we produced a stratification. We produced something like, I don't, I hate to use these things because I don't want to give you pictures that are not quite right. Because we, all of our pictures are going to be material world pictures. You'll have to rethink what I'm going to say in the next sentence. We develop layered desire bodies so that, uh, there was sort of, sort of something like cream floating to the top of milk. And that we, so that in the, as many people who as had developed an awareness of attractive desires versus repulsive desires has stratified or layered desire bodies. Now, this gave the hierarchies an opportunity. It gave them a very big opportunity. Now, a few minutes ago, we said that the uh, desire body is the reflective projection of the human spirit, in the threefold spirit, and that is the self. 
That is the spiritual eagle. So what happens is that in as many people who have stratified their desire bodies, in the higher part of the desire body, they help to produce a pseudo-ego. And this pseudo-ego was a reflection of the true self. And the purpose of this pseudo-ego was to take the place of what the hierarchies had been doing all along. That is, it was to look out for number one. If the gods couldn't look out for us, and since we had become self-centered human beings, we were given this second self, this lower nature. Uh, the best word that I that I can think of for it is a pseudo-ego, because it isn't a real ego, it's a false ego. And the purpose of it was to take care of us, to be a defending spirit. And we made progress. We made progress because, even if it was for base reasons, to aggrandize ourselves. Hey, I can do things you can't do. That means I'm better. And this gave us incentive that would normally would have been given by the hierarchies drawing us along. Now, there are a lot of things that I don't understand about all of this, because I don't understand why the false ego would be in the higher desire body. I can see why that's desirable, because if the false ego were in the lower desire body, it would, even, it would be even worse. We would become really malevolent beings like some of the horoscopes that we looked at today. Now, remember when we said that in the moon period, the origin of our desire body was in the world of thought. Now, what happened is here, uh, the Lucifers didn't give up. They still use us. And they co-opted this. And they co-opted the plan of the hierarchies, which worked to some extent. It worked in that we did take care of ourselves, but we took care of ourselves sometimes in awfully nasty ways. Sometimes the mafiosi even say, I had to take care of business today, which means that they wiped somebody out, and that's the kind of thing that went on. But in any case, the Lucifers sort of indicated to us that if we, this pseudo-ego, the true spirit couldn't enter in yet. It wasn't strong enough. And it takes a long time to become fully indwelling. So the spirit couldn't guide us. And this pseudo-ego was free from the spirit. But at the same time, as we lost clairvoyance, even in our personal consciousness, we lost contact with the pseudo-ego. It was unconscious or subconscious to us. And the Lucifers helped people to realize, hey, you're in a good spot here. The gods can't get you. The god from within can't get you yet. And the personality can't get you. Why don't you set up shop for yourself? And that's precisely what happened. The lower nature, the pseudo-ego, has become a power unto itself, which isn't all bad. It does what it was supposed to do, but we're getting beyond that. We're getting to the point now where we're supposed to live by sacrifice, not for self anymore. We're self-conscious enough that the spirit is entering in and it can begin more and more to take control of life. So now the pseudo-ego has a new function. And the new function of the pseudo-ego is to provide the isometric uh, necessary resistance to the true self. So that in struggling with the lower nature, in struggling with the pseudo-ego, the self becomes stronger. And we see it more all the time. Like if you study uh, psychology, like I think uh, almost every student of uh, mysticism should read Sigmund Freud's psychopathology in everyday life. That's the one where he talks about Freudian slips. And you can see that Freudian slips disclose what's going on in the pseudo-ego 
when we think we're, you know, how does Shakespeare say it? Oh, what wretched airs hath mine heart committed whilst it thought itself so blessed never. Uh, that's exactly the way it works. We think we're really nice people. If we were really nice people, we would have unfolded to such an extent that we would be godlike and we would be initiates and we would be saints and saviors of other people. But we're not. We're not those things. So we have to realize there's something cooking behind the curtains that we don't know that what's going on. Uh, otherwise, we would, we would be in a better place. And uh, you can see with what are called Freudian slips that you get a glimpse of what is behind the curtain. You see, and it's always interesting because you see when you undergo a Freudian slip, that the true spirit has forced the uh, the lower nature, that pseudo ego, to reveal itself. The same thing happens with dreams. We may have all kinds of uh, selfish things cooking in the lower nature, but by the pressure of the true self, they come to the surface in dreams, and we get symbolic. Uh, pictures of what's going on in our soul development and what we need to uh, do to progress. So, this is where things stand now. Things stand now with that we have a problem with desire. We have a divided self. And this lower nature, this pseudo-ego, is a very formidable adversary is what Max Heindel calls it. Uh, it's uh, We have all of this pseudo-self-love and all of this egoism and we have uncontrolled expression of desires. We do things just for the sake of desire because we love it. The, the pseudo-ego thrives on desire and it keeps its power through desire and so do the Lucifers. So, this is our state, and if we observe our state, our divided state, it appears to me that what the Rosicrucian philosophy teaches what we are and how we got to be here, from what I can see, just like we said in the very first talk, their view of the cosmos describing what a human being is, is accurate, and when it gets down to the detail of having a divided self, it is extremely active. This is what we have to do. We have to work with the problem of the divided self. If we don't, and the division becomes more and more severe, we have insanity. We have a schizophrenia. That's what schizophrenia means. It means a psychological division. A psycho psychological division that is irreparable. All right we can see what our situation is. We, in the last, the two nights previous to this, we have talked about the nature of the desire world and the way things work in the desire world. And in the first talk, we have seen what the purpose of desire is. Now, tomorrow evening, what we're going to talk about is what we battle with the pseudo-self what we can do to overcome and be divine spiritual beings that we were intended to be. And just if for no other reason, we can have peace. Because as long as we've got, you know, it's like when we looked at the Jay Gould horoscope this afternoon. That was a horoscope that there was so much greed there, it would never be satisfied. You can never satisfy a desire because the desire wants more and more to experience the desire. That's what it lives on, is that excitement. And so, this is what we're going to be talking about tomorrow night, how to work with desire, how to work with the pseudo-ego, and to become peaceful, creative people. Let's uh, close with the student's prayer. O oh God, increase our love. Turn that cold on. <laughs>
fits because Lucifer's work with technical thought. This is why our creations are not harmonious to nature. This is why if you put a mirror out there or even a shiny hubcap on an automobile, a bird will dash its head into it all the time because it doesn't understand mirrors. And uh, I learned when I used to, if I go walking around the lake or if I ride my bicycle around the lake, the birds run for me, the ducks. But if I ride the car, they don't because they don't under the, the, the group spirit which is angelic, or archangelic, doesn't understand the brain consciousness, the use of theory consciousness. 